take was why is it that during the first 40 years of Pakistan's existence, we were one of the top economic performers in the world, growing by six and six and a half percent per annum over a long period of time, bringing down poverty from 50 percent to almost 30 percent, and we were ahead of our big neighbor, which was India, which was growing at that time uh, by 3% only. And Bangladesh was still struggling at that particular point of time. We were ahead of Vietnam. We were ahead of China. And then from 1990 onwards, we have become a laggard. Not only that India is shining with 6 7.5% growth rate, Bangladesh is also doing extremely well and both international trade as well as on domestic front, we are way behind our neighbors. And that started me to think as to what is the contrast between these two periods. Although I must say, economists make a lot of assumptions in order to make their models elegant and tractable. So there is an overlap between what happened in the 40 years and what happened in the later years, but at least for the sake of broad simplification, I can divide this period of 70 years of Pakistan's history in two periods. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are old Pakistan hands would agree with me that Pakistan had six major shocks during the first 40 years of its history. The partition gave a truncated country with two wings apart by 1,000 miles, with no infrastructure, with no financial resources, and a very backward agrarian landscape. That was the beginning of this particular economy. Then we have an influx of 8 million refugees from across the border, and a poor country had to rehabilitate them and integrate them, and that was almost one-fourth of the total population of the country. And with such meager resources, you had to find you know, housing and jobs for these people. And the third shock came when we had the 1965 war with India, our big neighbor, and we were actually confronted with a situation where our big ally, which was the United States of America, decided not to come to our help, although we were member of the Cento and Seattle, and we were left on our own. And the fourth shock was the separation of one half of the country in 1971. I had the privilege of serving in Bangladesh, which was East Pakistan, and I could never imagine that we will be confronted with this kind of eventuality, but this is a fact, and there are many reasons, and I don't want to go into this. And the fifth shock was a very charismatic leader who aroused the sentiments of Pakistani public for the first time. Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto came to power, and he could do a great deal in order to put the country on the trajectory, which was continuing during Ayub's time. But he reversed all the gains which we had. One industrialization was completely stopped because he nationalized a little bit of industry which the country had. He nationalized the banks and the insurance companies, and from my perspective, more, I would say, important nationalization was that of the educational institutions. The best educational institutions in Pakistan were taken over by the government and completely ruined. And that 
was a major setback. And the sixth was the involvement of Pakistan in the war against Soviet Union, in which we be became a frontline state. So despite these six major shocks, which any other country uh, would find it very difficult um, to actually get out one after another, our economic record was stellar. And then we had the downfall. From 6%, we went down to 4% in the, during the 1990s, and the poverty again went up from 30% to 35, 36%. So that declining trend was also arrested. And came the, again, the period of a military rule, which put the country back on economic track with six and a half, seven and a half percent growth rate following China and India being the leaders, and we were the third. And then since 2008, again, we were on a downward path with three and three and a half percent till 2014, till 2017, when we again started growing. But in 2018, we are in very serious, difficult situation. So this led me to the conundrum as to what is the reason for this contrast in the performance of the two periods. And I looked at the literature, and there are five propositions in the literature, both academic literature, but I also used the popular literature, because you cannot really ignore what people are saying. And I found five popular hypotheses, and I tested each of those hypotheses with very sound empirical data. And the data was collected here from very reliable sources, not the government data alone, because there is always a suspicion about the government data. And the first uh, hypothesis is that this is a terrorist state, this is a nuclear power, this is a rogue state, this is the run by extremists and the fundamentalists, and how can a country like that actually grow and do well economically? Now, if you look at the data, from 1990 to 1999, actually up to 2001, before <laughs> the war on terror in Afghanistan, Pakistan was a very peaceful country. We had tourists from all over the world, we had students exchange programs from Africa, from other parts of Asia, and we were a very peaceful nation. But the economic growth really declined at that time. So 2001 to 2007 or 8, there were assassination attempts three times on the president of Pakistan, on the prime minister of Pakistan, attacks on the general headquarters of the army, on the ISI. So the terrorist activity was at its peak, but we still grew by, you know, six, seven percent. And then you again had a decline, but the correlation between the terrorist activities for that period really was positive. So when you have such a mixed record of erratic behavior between the variables you do not find, a consistent pattern. And therefore, this particular hypothesis falls short of its explanatory power. The second hypothesis was that whenever Pakistan has done well in the 1960s, in the 1980s, and the early 2000s, it was because of the large foreign assistance. And Pakistan is so used to foreign assistance that whenever the plug is pulled, we collapse. And that was something which very many people believe. And before looking at the data, I also had the same perception. So I carefully looked at the 1960s flows, and I took 
the total flows, not the official flows only, but I took the total flows and compared them with the 1960s when we were growing very fast and 1970s when we were slacking and found that in the 1970s we had more foreign assistance although the composition had changed. It was not coming from the Western powers, but it was coming from OPEC countries who were become very rich. So Libya and Saudi Arabia were pouring in billions of dollars in Pakistan economy as compared to $650 million, which the World Bank Consortium used to provide to Pakistan. Yes, in the 1990s, again, the US assistance increased. But in the 1990s, the US assistance declined. But the total flows were much higher than the 1980s. And the residents and the non-residents of Pakistan provided $11 billion, which were frozen in May 1998. So that was financing the current account deficits of the 1990s. In 2001, 2007, yes, we got again the resum resumption of the US aid, but the 2008, 2013 was the peak period we got the Carry Luger Berman appropriations bill, which provided one and a half billion dollars every year, which is much higher than what was happening in the early part. So the evidence, again, does not coincide with the popular perception of the foreign aid being the explanatory factor. The third factor was that the military dictators have been preferred by the US and therefore they were able to have a politically stable environment and you have political stability, it provides a very conducive environment for investment and growth. But as I pointed out to you, that US has its own interests. And irrespective of the regime in power, wherever there is a coincidence and convergence of the US interests, with that of Pakistan, then it is something which happens for the benefit of the country. But where there is a divergence between the two interests, it doesn't matter whether you have a dictator or you have a Democrat. The first shock came in 1965 when we expected that as a member of the Seattle and Cento, we will get the US support because we were dependent on the US at the same time. In the Cold War, we decided to align ourselves squarely with the West. And all our equipment and other armaments were procured from the United States. And we couldn't get the, even the spare parts at that time. So there was a divergence of the interest. It was a Yupan period, couldn't care less. 1971, Nixon and Kissinger, both in their writings, demonstrated that there was a tilt towards Pakistan. But in real fact, neither the US came to the rescue, nor China came to the rescue. It was very much propagated. I was in Bangladesh at that time. It was propagated that China will come to Pakistan's rescue. It didn't happen that way. This was Yahya Khan's period, another military dictator. And Ziaul Haq's time, it was the Symington Amendment, which led to complete suspension of aid to Pakistan. It was only resumed after the Soviet invasion. So wherever the Soviet invasion and Pakistan's interest converged, of course, that was the case. But before that, this was not the case. And I remember that when President Clinton came to visit, and I think Robin will recall that, he made it a point that he should not be seen in even shaking hands with Musharraf. And he gave a lecture to the people of Pakistan that this is not the right way that you should have a military dictator on the 
public television. And Pakistan was put to the nuclear sanctions. And on the top of the nuclear sanctions, there were the military sanctions against Musharraf. So I don't think it is right to argue that it is the support of the Western powers to the military dictators which led to the higher growth rates. The fourth hypothesis is that the external conditions have not been very conducive since 1990, and therefore Pakistan has suffered. Now, in the same external environment, India has grown by 7.5%. Bangladesh has grown by 5%, and now they're growing by more than 6%. They have four times exports have increased of Bangladesh, of four times of India and five times of Bangladesh, and Pakistan's have remained static. So same external conditions are facing our neighbors. And how come, if those conditions were adverse against Pakistan, why would they help India and Bangladesh rather than penalize Pakistan? So that particular factor is also not very persuasive. And again, a very popular hypothesis, which has again been replayed in the recent elections, is that Pakistan is a garrison state. It is the mighty military which decides as to what should happen to the country. And therefore, they have the corporate interests, and they have to protect their corporate interests. So I did an analysis of the combined corporate holdings of all the military enterprises from the Fauji Foundation, Army Welfare Trust, Shaheen Foundation, Barrier Foundation, F Frontier Works Organization, and also the NLC. And I found that only 4.5% of the market cap of all the enterprises are owned by the military, 4.5%. And unincorporated enterprises are much smaller. The larger enterprises are the fertilizer factories, the cement factories, the sugar factories. They account for only 4.5%. And therefore, to preserve the corporate interests, it's, not count, it's only counterintuitive that the military would not allow good economic management to prevail in the country. And I say this from my personal knowledge, that when we had a fiscal situation which was highly comfortable, we created a hundred billion rupees of armed forces capital fund in order to replenish the decaying equipment replacement of the tankers and ships and submarines and others. But as soon as the economy declined, that fund just disappeared. So it is in the interest of the armed forces to actually have a buoyant economy because they will be the beneficiary of it. So they cannot be blamed that in order to protect their small corporate enterprises, who pay the taxes, by the way, the same like other enterprises, there are no preferential treatment to them. I criticize the Frontier Works Organization and the NLC in my book because they are anti-competitive. And I want a competitive market structure in which they should take part. So I do criticize them. But all other uh, or, uh, enterprises are in the same domain as the private sector enterprises. And the major thrust of the Garrison State argument is that because so much is being spent on defense expenditure, that development and human development, particularly education and health, are crowded out. Ladies and gentlemen, to my own surprise, six to seven percent of GDP was spent on defense 
between 1950 to 1990, when we had the peak of our economic growth. And their share of defense expenditure in the total government expenditure was in 30%, 40%, and had even reached 50%. And since the 1990, it's been on decline. And 2017 and 18, it was only 2.7% of GDP. And it is 18% of the government expenditure. Education and health today, together, account for 3.7% of GDP. And development expenditure is even higher. So I don't see <coughs> the crowding out on the other hand, when the economy is booming, more resources were given to the defense expenditure. So this hypothesis of crowding out also doesn't work. So these were the five explanatory hypotheses which I tested through the empirical evidence. Then I said, what is the reason? So I looked at the theory and empirical evidence of other countries. And there are two very major empirical studies, one done by the IMF for 94 countries, and one by Asian Development Bank for 36 or 37 developing Asian countries. And they found a very close correlation between the quality of the institutions and the governance indicators and the economic growth. So that put me on the track to pursue this line. And fortunately, we have now a data set for world governance indicators, which is control of corruption, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and we have Transparency International. Then there's a World Competitiveness uh, Index. Then there is a Human Development Index. So we took all these indicators and looked at their performance between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And all the indicators for India and Bangladesh are upward moving, except that Bangladesh was considered as the most corrupt nation in 2005 and 2006 and 2007. But since then, it has improved. But Pakistan actually started going down on all these indicators during the 1990 to 2015 period. Therefore, the question arose as to why these institutions of governance are important. So I looked at the Pakistan institutions in the earlier period. And those of you who are familiar with that period, the Pakistan Industrial Development Corporation created the industrial base of Pakistan from scratch. We had no industries. With the help of the PICIC and IDBP, which provided the financing, we created a whole network of industries which were able to export to the rest of the world a strong institution. We were 30 million people, but dependent on the PL-480 imports from the United States for our food security. <coughs> the Agriculture Development Corporation brought in the Maxi Park seeds and the Iri rice from the international institutions and completely changed the whole production cycle in Pakistan. And as of today, Pakistan is surplus in wheat. We produce 26 million tons. We need only 25 million tons for our domestic consumption. We export 6 million tons of rice. So the entire food security calculus changed because of Agriculture Development Corporation and WAPDA which was a strong institution which created the Indus Basin Works after the treaty with India. Tarbela Dam, Mangla Dam, all the link canals, all the barrages, and brought in 
10 million acres of land under cultivation. So, so impressed was the World Bank that all the engineers who were working on Indus Basin Works, led by Mr. Salar Kirmani, were appointed by the World Bank and sent all over the world to demonstrate that if you really want to do the water resource management and irrigation, these are the people who would guide you. I just take these three examples and compare them with what is happening today. PIDC is known only for the building on the cross-section of the Pearl Continental and Sheraton Hotel. That's the only thing they have. They have just one building left, which was constructed in the 1960s. The Agriculture Development Corporation, even I don't know whether it exists on the paper or not, because they're not doing very much. And WAPDA has gone all over the place. It is one of the most inefficient organizations. The reason is that the distribution companies of power today are incurring losses and creating circular debt, which leads to about 2 to 3% of GDP. So your fiscal deficit is rising because of the inefficiencies of your public sector corporations. PIA, which used to be the lead you know, flyer in the world, set up Singapore Airlines, set up Emirates, now is in such a bad shape that we have to underwrite their debts and the liabilities. So you make a comparison at the micro level between these strong institutions and the institutions now, and you can see what our difference is. And I was very lucky to have 10 conference proceedings of Wilson Center, which looked at energy, water, food security, education, health, and behind every one of these conference proceedings was a conclusion that it is the governance structure which is really responsible for the poor performance. So I decided then that if this is the major explanatory factor, which is the institution decay, why did they happen so? Why did this happen so? Now, a lot of people have criticism of the civil service of Pakistan, including my friend Nadim ul -Haq, whose father was the chief secretary and one of the very competent, you know, civil servant. At that time, the civil servants were completely free to do things according to their own judgment and professional ability. There was very little interference from the politicians because we had security of tenure. We were guaranteed by the Constitution that nobody could remove us from the service arbitrarily. As soon as Mr. Bhutto took over, the first thing he did, he didn't like the CSPs, which is the counterpart of the ICS in India, and abolished the service, and brought in a new cadre of service, merged them into 22 grades, <coughs> brought in lateral entry, which means that his own cronies nominated people to become the civil servants. And that was the start of this process. And in the 1990s, thank to Mr. Ghulam Khan that he was able to insulate Mr. Ziaul Haq, whose interest was only one, which was Islamicization of the country, nothing more. He left the economy to Ghulam Khan, who relied on the senior civil servants to carry this forward. But in the 1990s, the civil servants were then <coughs> divided into pro-government or anti-government. And the new government came in, and all the civil servants shifted from loyal, were shunted out, 
and those who were officers of special duty were brought in to the office. And therefore, instead of merit and competence, we have a new culture of loyalty. And that has spread like wildfire. We did some work for the reforms of the civil service, produced a report, the NCGR. Nadim helped uh, a great deal when he was a deputy chairman planning commission. Essan Iqbal carried that forward in the planning commission. But no political government is willing to bite the bullet. And that is the reason why our civil service, which men these institutions, is responsible for most of the economic mismanagement of this country. So what do we do? Now, I'm not a quitter. And people said, oh, you did this report, and nobody cares for your report, so nothing will happen. I said, no. In this book, I said, OK, if you don't want to do across the board reforms simultaneously, because it is very hot potato for you politically, <coughs> let us do this an incremental and selective approach. And take 24 institutions which are responsible for security, growth, equity, and accountability, and strengthen these 24 institutions. And I've given a list, I've given a rationale, and how to go about this. So we hope that this new incoming government, which has publicly announced that it is committed to improved governance, to a strengthening of institutions, will take cognizance of these recommendations. And we hope that over a period of time, these recommendations for strengthening these institutions. I, I just finish by giving you one example why I selected these 24 institutions. One, they should have a spillover effect which will also affect the other institutions. Example, if you bring in people of integrity and competence as the chairman and members of the federal and the provincial public service commissions, they will select people purely on merit and nothing else. And when you select the merit, people on the merit, they're not beholden to the politicians. So when they head the ministries or the institutions, they will bring in their own team of the people who can deliver. And therefore, this is the organic process of the bottom-up approach through which the institutions are cleansed and refined and reshaped. Top-down approach doesn't work. And therefore, you select Federal Board of Revenue, Securities Exchange Commission, Competition Commission, organizations which have a reach which is quite widespread, and reform them and you will find a snowball effect which will affect the others. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the crux of the message which I wanted to convey through this book. And I hope that somebody is listening. Thank you.